speed. We're in a speed read here today. We've got a short time. We're starting a little bit later today for those online. You're going to get a short lesson. Uh, we've got two, count them, two lessons we've got to get through today. And they are related again. It's kind of intentional with the way I designed this program. Resisting evil and the devil and walking in faith. Well, how do you resist the evil and the devil? By walking in faith, you're going to resist evil and the devil. So I am going to, uh, I need you to understand, first of all, as, as a Christian church, as a Lutheran Christian church, we do believe that there is a thing called Satan and the devil. Uh, but uh, because of Christ's victory over death and victory over Satan and his death and resurrection, Satan doesn't have power over us in the same way I think some Christians kind of fantasize about it. So we're going to talk a little bit about what that is and what you should do as a result of this and probably not give it as much thought as you really think you should or maybe some groups don't. So Satan is a real personal evil, okay? Not just a force. It's not like watching Star Wars, right? Where the force is with you and there's a dark side of the force and blah, blah, blah. There is a Satan that's personal, that doesn't tend to seek to destroy us, okay? There's a hint in the Bible. Perhaps this was a fallen angel, but don't make too much of this stuff. We really don't know much about this character or individual. But I can tell you, we should never underestimate Satan and his, his angels that work with him because he's cunning and powerful and evil, but never give him too much credit either. So I think one of the problems in a lot of Christian churches is they attribute way too much evil to Satan. And I mentioned, uh, I don't know if it was here in the sermon or Bible study, I can't remember, but we have a neighbor here in East Pittsburgh that believes that everything that happens at her house is a sign that Satan is working and blah, 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 and there's all this chaos at her house and she's asked me to come and pray for her house because there's an evil force that lives in the house and I finally had to look at her and say the only evil force the only force for for bad and, and, and not good in your house is you you're creating the chaos but it's so easy when the bad things that happen we can blame on somebody else so if you're sitting here and looking at your life and saying all oh, these bad things are happening Satan's attacking me Sometimes it's just life, and sometimes it's your own decisions that you make. So don't give Satan too much credit. I use a story that I think is pretty accurate about this. If you remember um, December, well, you don't remember. None of us, you don't remember. I don't remember. December 1944, okay? December 1944 in Germany. Germany was all but defeated, okay? And so the Allies were sitting back here in Belgium and getting ready for that last push once the spring came of pushing into Germany and finishing it. So, so Hitler was basically defeated. There was nothing he could do. But Hitler brought, took all of his reserves and uh, all of his tanks and in one last ditch effort tried to push through the Allied line in what now became known as the Battle of the Bulge. Thousands, tens of thousands of soldiers died, U.S. soldiers and, and so forth died in that battle. It was horrible, and they were not, the U.S. soldiers were not prepared because they weren't expecting it. They were thinking it would be in the spring, so they didn't have the, the clothing for it. They weren't prepared for it. Someone went out with maybe, you know, one clip of bullets, and they're trying to fight this German atta attacking army. So Hitler was basically all but impotent. There was no way he could change the course of the war. But trust me, he did hurt us. And a lot of people are dead because of that lack of preparation. So don't overestimate him. Don't underestimate him, okay? He can hurt, but he's not going to win the war, okay? The war is over. The war is over against Satan. It was over 2,000 years ago in Jesus Christ. But here's the weapons that Satan does use. Doubt, okay? The weapon of temptation. The weapon of fear. All right, so, um, but I also have to be careful about fear. Not everything that we are afraid of is a temptation of Satan. I actually went in, oh, I have this running battle. <laughs> she won't watch it. My mother-in-law. <laughs> fears of Satan, our fears of devil. And fear is sinful. You're sinful when you're sinning. 
There's nothing in the Bible that says that. Jesus was afraid on the night he was betrayed because of what he was going to face on the cross. That's reasonable fear, isn't it? It is reasonable to be afraid of things that can harm us physically. It's reasonable to be afraid of, you know, standing on top of a very high building and afraid of falling. That's a reasonable fear. It is a reasonable fear to be afraid of a venomous spider or snake. God puts those types of fears in us as a warning. Don't be stupid. So you fear it, but then you learn how to respect it and work through that fear. So, but when I'm talking about fear, I'm talking about unreasonable fears. In particular, the fear that Satan puts in our brain is, I'm afraid I'm going to go to hell. That's the fear that the Bible talks about that is from Satan. Not the fears of reasonable things, but the fear of going to hell. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, guess what the chances of are, are you going to hell? Zero. And so what we do is we live our life large. And so here's, see, Martin Luther, let's get into this. Martin Luther, prior uh, to Lutheran Church, prior to, he didn't really start the Lutheran Church. It was never his intention. But he, his intention was to reform the Roman Catholic Church. And he heard about the, but, you know, he, said, he realized that his whole relationship with God was built on fear. That he was afraid of going to hell, and that's why he did the things he did. And he said, how can one who's been saved by grace be afraid? We, we are rooted in Christ. We're going to make mistakes, but that doesn't mean that we should be afraid that God is going to push us down the slippery slide, uh, sloping uh, slide to hell because we make a mistake. That's just part of the life process of growing, right? So um, that's how fear is used. So he finally realized that he no longer needs to be afraid. His life is in God's care. Go live your life. He used a phrase that he said, sin boldly. He didn't mean go out and do whatever you wanted to. He means go live your life big and broad. And if you make a mistake, you've got a God who's already forgiven you for that. And then because you live it big and broad, if you make a mistake, you can correct it. You know, it's, if you've ever played, did you ever play an instrument? Mm -hmm. What did you play? Piano, organ and flute. Organ and uh, flute. Did you? <laughs> so, uh, so flute you probably played in a band. Okay, so one of the things, I've been in choirs, I've been in bands and other things, and, and when you're practicing, one of the things a choir director will tell you or a band director is, play it loud, boldly, and confidently so I can hear the mistakes you're making and correct you, okay? You told me to stick to sewing. <laughs> right, and that sometimes is what they say. You know, maybe there's another profession for it. But for other people, you can at least correct it, but sometimes people play so timid, mm -hmm. and they can't be heard because they're afraid. So that's what Luther was saying. Play it loud and broad, because if you make a mistake, and God say, okay, really well done, but we can correct that and go a little bit different direction with that. Play it this way. So that's what Luther meant by sinning boldly. And he said also, here's a respect that you ought to pay to Satan. Turn your back to Satan, lean over, and let loose some gas. <laughs> that's what Luther said about Satan. Don't pay him any respect, and don't give in to that temptation of fear for your salvation. Again, fear of heights, fear of venomous things, reasonable fears that God has placed in our hearts so that we not do something stupid, okay? But he's talking about always, in the context of the Bible, fear of losing our relationship with God is not something we have to be afraid of, okay? So, um... You know, I'm, not, I'm going to go down to this, how can we defeat evil and the devil? Uh, we need to realize that we have been, by what Jesus Christ has done, transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. This is what Jesus has done. This is what the unique, I would say it's unique observation. This was, again, the observation of the entirety of the Lutheran Church. We stand on one thing. You're saved by grace through faith. That's the only thing that matters to us. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. If you want to know what Lutheran is, that's who we are, okay? Uh, we have very little systematic theology compared to other denominations that want to control every single little detail of what you believe about the Bible. The only thing we care about as Lutheran Christians is that you know that you're saved by God's grace. And this is illustrated to us through the sacraments, Holy Communion and Baptism, which means that we see the sacraments of Holy Communion and Baptism 
differently than other denominations do. We're going to get more into detail with that, but in essence, Holy Communion and baptism are God's gift to us. Some denominations, Holy Communion and baptism are things that we do to prove ourselves. In Lutheran Church, it's what God has done to tell us that He loves us, so that we have the security to live our lives. Hi, hey guys. Broadly and boldly. There you go. So that's how you live your life. You defeat the devil, again, by devoting yourself, as we saw last week, to devotion and prayer, by staying in proximity with other Christians, by living our lives for Christ, and just, you know, opening up that daily conversation with God. So again, it's Bible study, prayer, living your life within the context of the church, so that you are surrounded by people who love you and care for you. That's, in essence, the first lesson. Hey, how did I do on that first one? Very nice. I know. I still, so, aha! Uh -huh. We still have five minutes, so it means I'm going to do ten minutes. Ten minutes on this. We'll start a later service, a little late. Are you going to do this thing about the, the belt of truth? I did That's okay. I didn't go through any of that. That's based upon. But that's always a favorite reading. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6. six yeah. It's a very devotional chapter um, that we can make more of than we should. It's just metaphorical description of how, how they we get dressed in the morning. How we get dressed in, in our faith as well as yeah. we do in the morning. And it's a beautiful thing. Read it. I encourage it. It's a part of our, you know, about putting on the breastplate of righteous gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the yeah. helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit. And um, she used to get so, the job done. Yep. Helps us get up every morning and recognize that we're covered by God. God surrounds us. Goes before us, behind us, hems us in. And so Satan cannot harm us. So don't fear Satan. Don't fear the lie that you're going to hell because, oh gosh, I made a mistake today. <gasps> you're going to make a mistake today. You're going to make a mistake tomorrow that's going to harm somebody otherwise known as a sin. It happens. But it happens. It happens. Grow. Learn from it. That's all. That's all God wants us to do. All right. So going on. So how do we, what we do is give Satan his due, turn your rear to him and let loose some gas, and then we walk in faith and ignore Satan. Honestly, ignore Satan. And that's the, all right, just keep on walking by walking in faith. This is the key to what it means in understanding to be a Lutheran. For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. It is not of your own doing. It's the gift of God. Not the result of works, so that no one can boast. This is the frustrating thing that I have with some denominations that just annoy me. It's just like, yeah, but. Whenever you say, yeah, but, to that. Yeah, but you got to do this. Yeah, but you got to do that. Bam. Let me, let me use a good illustration of one recently. Um, <laughs> I love the meme wars that go on sometimes. I don't love the meme wars. They're stupid. But, I, so that's a sarcastic statement. The meme wars of, of Christians sometimes going back and forth. People will say how God loves everybody. And then in retaliation to that, people will say, yeah, but look what Jesus did. Jesus made people change and this and that and the other thing. To which I'm like, you both are right enough to be wrong. <laughs> okay? God loves everybody. And yes, God expects people to change, but who changes people? God does. So again, people are posting the meme, well, God expects you all to change. Well, you basically what the person is saying is, God expects you to change the way I think you should change, right? They're trying to impose their will upon you. No, God will change you in God's time. And it might take 20 or 30 years for God to change the thing that that person's looking and saying, you gotta change it now before you can be a faithful Christian. Here's our take in our church. You come to our church, I don't care what the condition is in your life, you are welcome to participate in our church. And if there's crap in your life that's got to get straightened out, guess what? There's crap in my life that's got to get straightened out, okay? So we sit here and just say, let's just walk together in faith. We're sinful, we're broken, God is healing. In the process of healing us every single day, we're walking in faith together, and so your thing that's messed up in your life is not worse than the thing that's messed up in my life. It isn't. I mean, it's arrogant. I'll tell you, let me, let me use a good example. This is, this is what's 
one of the gateway drugs that changed my mind about homosexuality, for instance. When I read the consistent, the Bible, the one thing I can say is if it's God's intention to change, I used to say in the 90s, uh, one of the things that frustrated me about pastors is pastors who are fat, who made, who ate their crispy cream, cream donuts every day and ate all their goodies and they had bellies out to here. They would get front in, in the pulpit and pound the pulpit out. Half gays are going to hell. And I'm like, you know, the Bible says that fat people are going to hell too, right? <laughs> and are out of God's will. So it's really ironic when a fat pastor who eats their Krispy Kreme canoe is going to die 20 years early because they haven't taken care of the body that's God's temple. And they have the audacity to sit here and condemn somebody else. The audacity. Um, that was my gateway drug that made me realize, you know, this the church has been so stupid about how we deal with I'm just using that as an illustration. Homosexuality, for instance. Is a homosexual welcome here? Yes. Do we say, you got to change? No. We had a homosexual on our, on our, on our, on our um, council. We've had a transgender person on our council. Was our council president? We don't care. Because these are things between God and that person. It's up to God to change people. We just want them to be loved. And these were really good people in our church. We don't, we don't have those expectations. That's between them and God, right? So we don't do that type of crap here. What we do ask is that you walk in faith. You be faithful in your walk with God. And we do that by trusting that God, where our lives are in God's care. So what is faith? Faith, according to the Bible, is actually a substance. You look at this thing in Hebrews. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. It is a substance and a foundation upon which we build our lives. It is the conviction that not everything going on in the universe can be perceived by our senses. There is a God that is also interacting with us. I can't prove that. We have faith in that. Okay? And um, the, um, the Greek word, the Greek work means title or deed that we have received. We have a faith or conviction, a title or deed to the kingdom of heaven. As people are Christians, we have the faith that God is, has made you, for instance, a child of God, and therefore you're an inheritor of the kingdom. You have title and deed to the kingdom. It's got your name on it because God put it there. We also need to make sure we distinguish between that there's a difference between faith and belief. Belief is a hope for something to take place in the future. Faith is acting on that belief. Does that make sense? You might believe something, but are you doing anything as a result of it? If you're not doing anything as a result of it, you don't have faith in the thing in which you believe. I believe that there's a God, therefore I'm taking a step out in faith to live my life as though there is a God. Okay? And ultimately, as a Christian, our faith is placed in Christ. And so how can we unleash the power through faith? Um, you see Mark there, Jesus answered, have faith in God, truly I tell you, if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown to the sea, if you do not doubt your hearts, but believe what they say will come to pass, will be done for you. It's a metaphorical illustration, okay? Don't take this to mean that, oh, if I pray for a car, I'm going to get it. Oh, that's stupid. That's not what he's saying. So I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you received it and it will be yours. Whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so your Father have may also forgive your trespasses. Uh, so he's saying that uh, we need to get rid of the baggage in our life so that we're open to what God's will is. You have to put this in context with a larger teaching of Jesus where he's saying that we pray for those things that are within God's will and God will be faithful to respond uh, faithfully to us. So we have faith. God is the subject of our faith. Jesus Christ is. And he says, if you, he's saying if you, God answers the prayer of anyone, any of you asking God, God's name, and you say something, so... Um, if we invite God to participate in our lives, God participates in our lives. You know, it reminds me, this is, it's not that God is a jerk, but you know, um, I have two older brothers, and I remember one time, I can't remember what I was doing, but I just remember distinctly working on something, trying to do something, and my older brother just kind of sitting there watching like this, and I was failing over and over. I couldn't put it up. It was something I was trying to put up or 
put together or something like that. He was just kind of laughing his butt at me, off at me. And then finally I said, well, are you going to stop laughing or are you going to help me? He said, I was just waiting for an invitation. <laughs> okay. Because sometimes we're so prideful and independent, you know, we need to invite God. God's kind of sitting there humorously watching us, trying to take care of our life and just say, just invite me. I'll help you, okay? So don't doubt. God is going to help us. That whenever we ask, don't put limits on God. But it does assume that we have a right relationship with God. We're not asking God for a Maserati or a million dollars. We're asking God for our daily bread. We're asking God to help us bless the world. We're asking God to help us be signs of God's reconciliation. Things within God's expectations for us as Christians. We believe this in our heart. Another, it's another description for faith. Belief, remember, is just believing something. Believing in our heart means I'm taking a step forward in that. And so this is kind of the description Jesus gives us of what faith is and how we walk forward and ignore the Satan character and trust that we're in God's re in relationship with God as Christians. And so here's how we keep strong in faith. We stay in relationship with other Christians. We read the Bible, we pray, we stay in relationship with other Christians. What is that called when we are in relationship with other Christians? It's called... C-H-U-R-C-H. Church. It's called the church. The church is an organization of believers in Jesus Christ who love each other and care for each other and confront each other and challenge each other in our walk with faith. Uh, because you know, I'm looking at Miriam right now, there are things that you know about life and faith that I don't know. No, no, not could be. Yeah. Is. Yeah. And we'll run into that. You're going you're to come to me some point. Pastor Dave, have you ever thought about it this way? That would be such a kind gesture on your part to do it. <laughs> Because you acknowledge, number one, I don't know everything, and I don't. Number two, you have something to offer to me that will help me. What a kind gift that is. Okay? And I have things that are kindness. And that's why I try not to be, this is the way it says it in the Bible. Get your life together. Because I'm just doing the best I can. I understand that I'm doing the best I can with the knowledge I have. Mm -hmm. But my knowledge is going to fail me. And so that's why we need each other. Um... That's the church. People in relationship with each other. And Jesus Christ is at the center of that. We're not here today because the Pittsburgh Steelers. You know, we're here today. Hey, Joni. We're here today. Why? Oh. No, I, I just... Oh. I didn't know there was another one. Yeah. Well... Oh, I wonder. I wonder. It might not have been on see, because. We don't know everything, do we? <laughs> oh boy. Well, we'll see if it's been recorded. Okay. At any rate, um, yeah. There you go. But it's walking in faith with each other. It's being diligent, relentless in our faith amidst the temptations or the concerns of life when Satan wants to throw in our our face. You're no good. You're worthless. You should be afraid of going to hell. We say, no, nope, I'm walking forward in faith and God is always with me and I walk forward like God is always with me no matter what I'm doing in my life. And therefore, we are bold in our relationship with God and our walk with each other. Okay, that's you know a little bit about the church, about walking with God. I've planted some seeds about baptism and Holy Communion that kind of are reflective in the Lutheran church of it is by grace you're saved through faith. There's a lot of material here, a lot to think about. Um, any questions that you might have because you're representing all the people watching at home today? No. I Nothing! Because I did it perfectly. No, no, no you're not. We're, none of us are perfect. <laughs> I'm close to, right? No, no, not even close. Not even close. Neither am I. I neither am I, but we give thanks. Let's end with prayer. Father, we do thank you again for the fact that you place us together, the fact that there is a church means that all of us have something to share that we all need from each other so that we can grow in our faith. Now, I'm up front, I'm at the altar, and I'm the one preaching all the time, and I've got the pulpit. But, you know, here's the truth, God. I, I'm really not smarter or better than anybody else in this church. And so I'm praying that everyone who's listening to this would just... Mm, be a little more confident in their relationship with you and say, hey, 
I've got something to offer too. That's just as significant as what Pastor Dave has to offer. Can you imagine if we had a church filled with people who were confident in their walk with God and understood that they too were a part of this process called the church? It's not the Pastor Dave show. It's, <laughs> it's right? <laughs> it's, it's your show and we are just privileged to walk in it together. So send us forth in your peace, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, go in peace. Thank you all for joining us. I hope the whole thing recorded. We're going to see right now. Did it? Did it? It did.